Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Malu Dumin in Israel. It's a good bit that human beings have always pretty much centered around the present. The past used to be much more on people's minds back in the good old days when such things as tribal histories mattered. But with the advent of the town-oriented society, that focus has taken a long, slow ride to the backseat of the mind. The future was always there in some manner, but it has always been difficult to focus on something that doesn't really exist. So that leaves the present, and that is precisely where we spend most of our time. This is not a particularly recent phenomenon, but there is little question that as the centuries have passed, more and more of our attention has been directed to the present. In current times, this focus is almost exclusive. We know something of the past, but most people really can't work up that much of an interest in it. There are too many interesting things going on right in front of our eyes. As we become more and more glued to those screens and whatever will come after them to occupy our increasingly short attention spans, we lose interest in everything else. Even the future holds little value to the here and now human mind. It is not something one can download, so who really cares? It would be interesting if somehow a significant portion of humanity really did develop an excitement for the future. We all should want to preserve the earth, and that all lies in the future. We all should hope to live long and fruitful lives, and that is the very definition of the future. We should and probably do have some curiosity about what is coming down the pipeline as far as the next stage of human progress and how we will interact with each other. That is the future in every sense of the word. So it is a little strange that we are so present-oriented when we have so much riding on what happens in the future. But what, what about the really distant future, long after each of us as individuals are gone? Most of us have trouble seeing beyond our own lifetimes and display little interest in what will not really concern us at all. But we are all on a collective journey here, and all of humanity, even those who do not share our time on the earth with us, are part of that journey. Those who have not yet had their shot at life might seem a bit hazy to those of us who are in the middle of it, but we were all once in that position in the eyes of those who came before us. The future has never really outgrown its comparison to a crystal ball. Now we scoff at such things, but in times past, they were looked upon as solidly as looking to the edge of the horizon. Sure, we weren't there, but we could easily imagine being there. So it was with the crystal ball. Gazing into its murkiness was catching a glimpse of what was coming. We lost something when we relegated such practices to the domain of superstition. We are no longer able to believe that the future is here in some manner. And if it is not existent, why should we care about it? In biblical times, interest in the future paralleled interest in the past. Both gave people an idea of where they stood in the great plan of destiny. The past told them how they came to be who they are, and the future told them what all their efforts and goals would lead to. The Bible is positively filled with references to the future. A good deal of prophetic teachings deal with the future. In fact, to most people, that is the very definition of prophecy. It should come as no surprise that when the the book of Deuteronomy, a great deal of attention is focused upon what is coming particularly at the end of the book, revealing the future becomes the primary goal. This week's Parsha is another double reading. The first Parsha is called Nitzavim, and the second, Vayelech. Nitzavim means standing present, or something like that. Vayelech means, and he went. Both are very short Parshas. In fact, they're the two shortest Parshas in the Torah, which is one of the reasons they are usually read together. The timing is such that Nitzavim is always read on the Shabbat immediately preceding the solemn and joyous holiday of Rosh Hashanah, which comes next Shabbat. Nitzavim has no definite theme and no storyline. It is the first parsha of the last third of the book of Deuteronomy, which revolves around the constant message of the future destiny in store for the Israelites. This message is not entirely pleasant. Most of the prophetic proclamations stress how much the Israelites will stray from the path advocated in the Torah. The consequences of this string are laid out as clear as day in the first half of this short Parsha. They include the classic exile from the land, abandonment by God, and a general sense of hopelessness. 
This is such a common theme in the book of Deuteronomy that it is almost expected by this point. However, the second half of the Parsha pushes just the opposite theme. This is the idea of teshuva, repentance, which will always be an option no matter how far the Israelites have strayed. Teshuva is presented as an inevitable stage in the destiny of the Israelites and the Jews. There is a virtual guarantee that at some point in the distant future, when all looks to be at its bleakest, the people will somehow find their way back to God and God will return to accept them. This has become one of the most important messages of Judaism, that tshuva is always available to whoever wishes to go down this path. This is the reason why this Parsha is always read right before Rosh Hashanah. The second Parsha of Ayelach is really the final personal message of Moshe to the Israelites. It describes his final instructions to both the collective community and to his successor, Yehoshua. Included in this message is a continuation of the theme that took up much of the previous Parsha, the inevitable straying from the path of the Torah. In this Parsha, things are told from God's perspective, with the important idea of God becoming hidden from the Israelites as a consequence of their abandonment of God. This is a kind of biblical karma. When we abandon God, God abandons us. That the Torah would introduce such an idea as God becoming hidden is a bit unexpected. We might think that the Torah would be more interested in stressing that God is always available to be found, which is certainly not a foreign idea in the Bible. But right here in this Parcha, at the end of the Torah, the opposite is found. God's presence is hidden, and the sense of hopelessness that comes when God is nowhere to be found is the result. The contrast between these two themes, God becoming hidden and God always waiting for us to return, is the dichotomy that is found in this double Parsha. The Torah makes no attempt to resolve this dichotomy. It is presented as simply the way things are. It is not difficult for any individual person to sense this dichotomy in their own life. There are times when God is so real as to be undeniable. And there are others when the entire idea of a God seems so ridiculous and foreign that it makes us wonder what we were thinking when we believed. This is one of the major paradoxes of life. There is a verse at the beginning of Nitzavim that clarifies to whom the warning of straying from the Torah is directed. Quote, it is not with you alone that I'm making this covenant and demanding this oath. Rather, it is with those who are standing here with us today before Hashem, our God, and those who are not with us today. Who are these other people not standing with us today? Are they the ancestors of those standing there today? A few verses later, this matter is cleared up. Quote, lest there be a man or a woman or a family or a tribe whose heart strays today from Hashem, our God, to go to worship the gods of those nations. Lest there be among you a root whose fruit is gall or wormwood, so that when he hears the words of this oath and secretly blesses himself, saying, I will have peace since I will follow the desires of my heart. This seems to be describing the very roots of rebellion against God. The person or the group are not doing anything terrible about at the moment. In fact, nobody else knows what is really going on in their mind but the root is there, deep within them, ready to spread its poison. This is the meaning of the gall or wormwood. Such a venomous plant enters the body and silently attacks its new host. The poison infects its victim at first with the promise that nothing bad will come of all this. I will be able to go along comfortably in my life, doing whatever I please, and none of this biblical curse or oath will affect me. The paragraph closes with an odd phrase. Quote, in order to add moisture to the thirsty. It is unclear what this means, but it is obvious that it is some sort of metaphor. It seems to refer back to that gall and wormwood poison, which silently assured its victim that they would be fine regardless of what they did. This reassurance waters itself. Once it is there, it never leaves. Once a person is not concerned about the effects of their actions and attitudes on their future spiritual condition, there is no defense. This is the beginning of the end. This covenant and oath at the beginning of this Parsha is a warning to all of us. It spoke to those who heard it directly, and it still speaks to us who hear its warning. We and all the generations who followed those who heard it 
are the intended recipients of this message. If we are not concerned about where we are heading in life, if we believe that no matter what we do, everything will turn out just fine, we are headed for spiritual disaster. The very attitude of, I can do whatever I want and I will always remain in my comfort zone is the root of future spiritual failure. The present is the only time to be concerned about the future. Any other time is too late. If we remain permanently fixed on the present, we lose all sight of the all-important future, which is precisely where we are headed. Those who cannot be bothered thinking about the future are like Alice asking the Cheshire cat, what road do I take? The cat asked, where do you want to go? I don't know, Alice answered. Then said the cat, it really doesn't matter, does it? Caring about the future is our ticket to a future of our own choice. Not caring subjects us to the whims of fate and meaninglessness. Which one do we want? The choice is ours. Shabbat Shalom.